So welcome everybody to the public forum with Professor Peter Norton. Um, I'm your MC today. My name is Lena Huda and I'm the Vice President of Walk Sydney. And I would like to begin to um, acknowledge with the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respect to elders past and present. I am joining from Wollongong, which is Darabal country. And please feel um, free to welcome to the chat function where are you coming from. And um, our event today is co-hosted by three groups. So as I said, I'm um, part of Walk Sydney and Walk Sydney is the peak body for walking in Greater Sydney. And it's a member organization um, by um, volunteers and um, it's free for people to join who have an interest in making um, Greater Sydney better for walking. And um, Eco Transit is a community group advocating for sustainable travel in Sydney. They are also co-hosting today and Friends of Erskineville. Um, it's a local residence organization in that area. And um, I also wanted to thank Andrew Chelter today who has um, contacted Professor Norton um, and asked him if he could speak to us today. And it's really fantastic that he has brought these three groups together and who is um, active within all three of them. And um, now I would like to hand over to Professor uh, David Levinson, who is also part of Walk Sydney. He actually co-founded uh, co Walk Sydney, and um, he will introduce our speaker today. So just um, just about you can ask questions. Please use the chat function at the moment, so then we can address it after um, the talk, and um, then. Later on, you can also um, choose to um, ask your question, unmute yourself and ask the question later on. I will call up questions after this talk. Thank you. All right, thank you. On behalf of Walk Sydney Eco Transit and Friends of Erskine Build, it's my pleasure to welcome Peter Norton, who's joining us on a Friday evening in the United States. Peter Norton is Associate Professor of History in the Department of Engineering and Society at the University of Virginia, where he teaches history of technology, social dimensions of engineering, research, and professional ethics. He is the author of the excellent Fighting Traffic, The Dawn of the Motor Age in the American City by MIT Press, which among other things examines the history of jaywalking and motordom, and of the newly released Autonor Autonorama, The Illusory Promise of High-Tech Driving, recently published by Island Press 2021. Peter, over to you. Thank you so much. I'm sharing my screen here. Uh, and I'm just uh, getting it uh, set up. Here we are. Uh, it's, a, it's a thrill to be here. I'm very grateful to Andrew, to Lena, to David, and to everyone else who made this possible. And it's a big honor to be among people who are helping to get us back to common sensibility. I want to stress that this is a return to common sense mobility that I think we have in mind and not just inventing it um, for the first time. Uh, as David said, it's Friday evening where I am. I have the strange feeling of speaking a little bit into the future. Uh, the future is actually some of tonight's subject as well. Um, I uh, want to stress that um, my subject is common sense mobility. By that, I mean sustainable, affordable, inclusive, healthful. Uh, we don't have that now, certainly not in North America. And I know there's uh, a lot of room for progress elsewhere in the world, including Australia. I think it, it helps to know that, as I put it in the title, history is on your side. This has a way of legitimizing a cause. If we can show that uh, there is a historical precedent for that which we seek in, uh, in the form of common sense mobility. Um, I think we learned from history why my fighting traffic is, is entirely historical, but to apply the lessons of history to the future in Autonorama, especially as a caution against promises of perfection. So when I speak about common sense mobility, I think that can be juxtaposed against the promise of transportation perfection, which I think has recurrently gotten us into trouble when we abandon transport sufficiency for the sake of transport perfection, we dig ourselves into an ever deepening hole that we are still struggling to get out of and we won't get out of it until we abandon fantasies 
of transport utopias for the sake of everyday ordinary um, transport. Now, uh, I wanna begin by stressing that common sense mobility is not new. And uh, as you can see in this little outline of where I'm going, I think there have been four generations of promises of perfection. I, I adopted General Motors term for those promises here in the word Futurama. And I wanna suggest a, a little bit about how we can get back um, out of this. Now, I think we got into this difficulty, and by that I mean uh, the vain pursuit of transport perfection by mixing up tools and solutions. And it wasn't through carelessness. It's rather because the people selling tools learn that they can sell more tools if they call their tools solutions. Now, if you look around and listen, you'll notice, as I'm sure you all have, that many people, especially people in marketing, use tool and solution interchangeably as if they mean the same thing and a solution has become the preferred term. But I wanna caution us that uh, there is no solution a solution is something that solves our problems for us. And I think we have to always remember that it is we who solve our problems and we need technology to do it. And when we choose that technology and put that technology to work for our chosen purposes and choose our tools, we are making technology into the tools that empower us. And when we think of technology as solutions, we surrender that control and, and um, fall into a, a kind of fantasy world where tools operate themselves and solve our problems for us. This is a great way to sell tools, but a very bad way to solve problems. I thought it would begin by connecting this with Australia, where we I see here a, a letter to the editor from 1973, when the Opera House in Sydney was new, and we see already a complaint about unsatisfactory parking. And I think it's refreshing to know that there are people um, objecting to this kind of mentality uh, right back then as well. Here's a reply from another Sydney area resident who <laughs> rather stri strongly objects to this demand that there be parking at the opera house. Um, the, the expectation that everyone, even in a big city like Sydney, should be able to park wherever they, wherever they go, is an idea that originated in the US and was exported around the world, including to Australia. It would be a beautiful thing if Jill Mullins, I hope is still with us and if uh, she's uncovered, because I think this is a wonderful rejoinder to Davis's um, letter. We see uh, history on our side in the form of both in the US and in Australia, a long history of advocacy for something better. These cyclists are blocking motor traffic in Sydney um, in 73, 74, uh, in part in response to the oil embargo of those years, but also as a demand for a more sustainable common sense mobility mode. And of course, what they were really doing is recovering something that was lost on the Harbor Bridge. The, on the Harbor Bridge, cycling was permitted in all lanes and there was also a, a rail crossing on the Harbor Bridge as well. So history was on the side of those advocates too. Now, I suspect you all know that uh, in uh, Melbourne in this case, there were plans to put in massive American style freeways through the city. Uh, these plans, of course, uh, were substantially pursued and many of these roads were completed. Um, we can see here in this map, uh, the extent of these plans. This is the Melbourne Transportation Plan of 1969. And as uh, probably some of you know, these plans were exported to Australia by an American engineering firm, the Wilbur Smith and Associates firm. And this is Wilbur Smith. Wilbur Smith was an engineer and he his training came in, funded entirely by automotive interest groups in the US with the deliberate intention of creating a generation of engineers who would rebuild cities around the needs of cars. So it was Wilbur Smith who introduced the idea or propagated the idea 
that a city's in trouble if people can't park everywhere they go and if people can't drive on express highways everywhere they go in the city. Now, many of these freeways were never completed. The dotted lines indicated cancel freeways, but the solid lines indicate that a lot of these freeways were indeed built. Now, I think of this as a kind of intelligent foolishness. In other words, the engineering takes intelligence, but the idea of conforming a city to the requirements of an automobile is, I think, fundamentally quite foolish. It's the least spatially efficient mode. It's expensive. You know all the rest. And I think this is a reminder of something very important. We're living in an era that celebrates intelligent systems, so-called smart systems, so-called. But isn't it obvious that intelligence without wisdom is dangerous? Uh, we can't know the purposes toward which our intelligence should be committed without some wisdom. Intelligence is, confers a kind of power, but power can be destructive as well as constructive. And so I think besides intelligence, besides smart systems, we need wisdom and we need the wisdom to come first. It is the prerequisite for the proper application of our intelligence and our smart systems. And so, in looking for guides for wisdom, uh, I don't think we could do better than uh, some of you may recognize Rachel Carson, the uh, American biologist and ecologist, whose 1962 bestseller, Silent Spring, was a caution about almost exactly the kind of problem we're in in cities today. So when she wrote Silent Spring, Rachel Carson was alarmed by farmers and foresters and gardeners who are interested in a kind of perfection delivered through chemical pesticides. And her message was chemical pesticides are not the problem. It's the pursuit of a per perfect garden, the perfect oh, farm, the perfect forest. Uh, and that, that's what gets us into trouble. And so she, her caution for us which we can generalize beyond ecology and into oh, yeah. urban environments and urban mobility, her caution was not to mistake uh, solutions for tools. She had a caution specifically against the war metaphor, which is ubiquitous, including in transportation. Now in uh, um, chemical pesticides, her caution took this form. She said on page eight of Silent Spring in 1962, the chemical war is never won because of, of course nature adapts and you as a result can never apply enough chemical pesticides to eliminate your insect pests. Now, how do we apply this wisdom to our interest in urban mobility and sustainability? Well, if we replace this word chemical with the word traffic, the statement is equally valid and for exactly the same reasons. And the reasons are that the pursuit of perfection in urban environments is a fool's errand. This is not the kind of situation where you pursue perfection. And the war metaphor, of course, is the wrong metaphor. Wars are inevitably destructive and wasteful. We need uh, a different metaphor than the war metaphor. And uh, Rachel Carson was offering us wisdom. It's astonishing to me that she explained this 60 years ago but we are only barely beginning to recognize, if at all, that this wisdom is applicable not just to ecology, uh, not just to chemical pesticides, but also to traffic. So to sort of symbolize this message, she's making a distinction between something that delivers perfection, a solution, um, a magic wand, is, which is what I'm trying to represent on the left there. Um, th this is a, a deception. What we need instead are tools. Notice the hammer is a tool we use for our purposes. It empowers us, unlike the magic wand, which is a solution with which we have no relationship. It, it's the thing that delivers for us. We need the tool and not the solution. This is Rachel Carson's message, and I think it's our, uh, I think it's for us as well, interested in urban mobility. Now, uh, I, I wanna be, begin the proper part of my talk by explaining that common sense mobility is not at all new. We have precedents. I'll show you a few pictures from the US. Circled in red are bicycles and bicycle racks in Rochester, New York in 1904. These are electric vehicles, of course. 
They also don't require batteries, which is the toughest part of, of the electric vehicles we like to talk about today. This is sustainable, healthful, inclusive, affordable, spatially efficient, healthful mobility. Um, and we lost all of this in the US and in much of the world as well. We see this in city after city. This is Milwaukee, bicycles everywhere. Here is even the Motor City, Detroit. In 1917, already at this point, over a million cars a year were being sold, but still even in Detroit, pedestrians and streetcars predominate over passenger automobiles. The two don't mix at all well, naturally. Here you see the conflict between pedestrians and motorists. In the US, this conflict was uh, very intense in the 1920s. As a result, we had rising fatalities, as you can see here, 15,000 a year by 1923, even though most people did not own a car. We can see that in cities, it was predominantly pedestrians, and among the pedestrians, it was predominantly the children who were being struck or killed. Notice the bar for the four to eight year age group. Um, and in the perspective of that era, the person to blame was the motorist, the motor vehicle, as you can see in this, in this imagery here, it is the automobile and the motorist that have the blame. This is a signal to us that that's a world that views walking and even child independent mobility by children as normal and, and proper. So in this sense, we have history on our side. We too, I think all would all agree, we want streets where uh, walking is, the, is prioritized and where children's independent mobility is prioritized as this, uh, this iconography from the 1920s captures. There were even public memorials to the children killed by motor vehicles as these examples from Baltimore and this one from St. Louis illustrate, that's a signal that these cities regarded these losses as public losses to be grieved publicly. And the blame went to speed and speed was connected of course with the motor vehicle. Now, if you wanna sell automobiles, of course, this is a threat to your business. Um, and the ultimate threat took the form of proposals like this one to require mechanical speed governors that would make it impossible to drive the car more than 25 miles an hour. These were fought by automotive interest groups who organized vote no campaigns to stop these things. This is from, the, uh, from Cincinnati in 1923. And they argued that these, are, these restrictions are stifling an industry and the industry's organized to fight back. The fighting back took a lot of forms, but what they all had in common was this mission, which was spelled out very explicitly. They said, we, the people who wanna sell the automobiles are the radicals here. We need a radical revision in our conception of what a city street is for. So in other words, there was a, a drastic effort, an effort to drastically redefine, reimagine the street as predominantly for motor vehicles. It was not an evolution. This did not happen gradually in response to consumer preference and consumer demand. This was a deliberate effort to prioritize motor vehicles despite the norms and the laws and the preferences of the time. One of the forms these campaigns took was anti-jaywalking campaigns. These cards are from them. Um, it, they also took the form, though, of new ideas like the um, divided motorway with grade separated interchanges and median strips and shoulders that were supposed to make traffic crashes impossible, hence the title foolproof highway. So the this sort of idea that led to motorways was the notion that you could make a highway where crashes were impossible. Notice that this is the same message we're getting today about autonomous vehicles, that they will make crashes impossible, as uh, this newspaper clipping will show. And one of the deliberate intentions of these campaigns was to increase the sale of automobiles. This uh, image is suggesting that with highways, more cars can be sold. Um, that's one of the intentions behind this effort. Well, to, to make this future attractive, General Motors in the 1930s developed depictions of the future that were vivid 
three-dimensional gigantic models. They called them Futuramas. A fu Futurama is a fusion of the words future and diorama, a model. And they presented these models as uh, visions of a future utopia where you could drive anywhere at any time without delay and without crashes and park for free when you get there. They promised this as a future on a horizon and the horizon metaphor was invoked frequently and it has the suggestion that this horizon is always receding before you the way horizons do, but in pursuing it, you sell ever more vehicles, roads, and so on. It's, uh, in other words, it's really the introduction of transport consumerism, which is obviously quite unsustainable. The genius behind this was Charles Kettering of General Motors. He said, you have to keep the consumer dissatisfied. It's rather like, think about the mirage on the horizon on a desert. The, the thirsty person lost in the desert pursues the mirage, seeking satisfaction, but never getting satisfaction. And it's, but it's that vision on the future, on the horizon, that keeps you going, that keeps you consuming in this case. Uh, Shell Oil Company had a model of this city of tomorrow, which at this time meant the city of 1960. And uh, one of the uh, engineers on the left, Miller McClintock, behind this idea, who was funded entirely by the automotive industry, was also one of the teachers of Wilbur Smith. So this is a du direct legacy, in other words, of this effort was the Wilbur Smith plan for Melbourne. And Wilbur Smith's plan was uh, sent, I mean, he had plans on all six inhabited continents for dozens of cities like this. General Motors evoked the image of the horizon. The idea was as you get closer to this utopian future, it recedes before you in such a way that the consumers keep pursuing it, keep buying ever more. The ultimate expression of this, as most of you I think will have heard of, is Futurama model in the Highway Horizons exhibit at the New York World's Fair in 1939 and 40. When you went there, you saw the city of 1960, the city of 20 years in the future, where everything seemed to work. It's a model. It didn't have to literally work. It just had to appear to work. We can compare this vision of the city of 1960, the city of 20 years into the future, with the actual city of 1960, side by side. Here is Portland, Oregon in 1962. It's not surprising that if you funnel this volume of motor vehicles into a city, you have to eviscerate the city to fit all cars in. This is a kind of obvious madness. Uh, on the other hand, it's a success story if you're selling cars, with the exception that you're going to get a lot of criticism. And there was indeed a lot of criticism. Um, people forget, when I hear the 50s invoked uh, re in reference to cars, I usually hear the assumption that everybody was okay with this. It, they were not, there was a lot of criticism. Um, what was happening, of course, was there was a promise of perfection, no congestion, thanks to highways. Uh, but when you actually put this in, this is Paradise Valley, the African-American neighborhood of Detroit in 1959. This is what happens when you apply the Futurama vision to it. This is the same view two years later. Uh, on the left, uh, you can see um, a church steeple that you can also see on the right. Uh, black Detroit was completely erased, at least this part of it was completely erased for suburban vehicles, which of course were overwhelmingly driven by white people from segregated suburbs. And then the center of Detroit was turned substantially into car storage. So this is a devastating way to try to, you know, move people in cities. Now this meant that there was a lot of skepticism and because there was skepticism, a new generation of promises had to be made. Why would people ever believe the new promises when the old promises had failed? The answer is simply we evoke the magic of the latest technology. I think this might sound familiar to us today. Now, the latest technology in the future on the two generation was transistors, also space age and rocket age technology. And so that was a response to the critics, critics like Jane Jacobs, 
Um, you invoke technology, the amazing electronics, the amazing transistors. None of these things can make car dependency work. None of these things have the slightest chance of making car dependency work. But they're just amazing enough to make credible, incredible promises. Uh, the the self-driving car was a well-developed vision even in the 1950s, and transistors were supposed to make them work. Uh, the word magic is significant because state-of-the-art technology resembles magic. Arthur C. Clarke said that in 1968, and magic has a way of making us believe that the impossible is possible, which is a very dangerous belief because it makes us pursue destructive goals, right? So. General Motors had a Futurama 2 exhibit at the New York World's Fair of 1964. Ford had a similar exhibit as well. This is the GM exhibit. But, and, and those are parking garages on the left, believe it or not. This was supposed to work um, thanks to uh, transistors. But as uh, you know, there was a lot of resistance to this as well. Here we see Alice Lipscomb opposing the, the uh, expressway in Philadelphia, in this case successfully. There were new values like uh, this is the first Earth Day celebration on the New York Times front page in 1970. We have Small is Beautiful coming out in 1973. All of these are criticisms of this kind of wasteful pursuit of a foolish utopia, right? Of course, this means you need a Futurama 3. Futurama 3 really developed in the late 80s and into the 90s. It was never called Futurama 3, but it was exactly the same idea. And it was also a way to sell electronics. Um, the new technology that's supposed to make this credible in the 80s and the 90s is the microprocessor. It, it, it did do amazing things like give us the Apple Macintosh, for example, and because it could deliver amazing things, it could lend credibility to incredible claims. Uh, in the US with the enormous weapons sector, um, these two things got linked. Now the Cold War was coming to an end. The weapons contractors were, the weapons merchants were alarmed that they were losing their biggest customer. So they thought we need to find uh, a civilian market and they thought fighting congestion is the way to go. Now, some of you may remember that in 91, during the Gulf War, there, there were press conferences like this one, where General Norman Schwarzkopf showed video uh, of targets being destroyed with precision. This is when the word smart developed that techie meaning that it has now. In other words, uh, these were called smart bombs. This was free advertising on the news for these, this stuff. Only 8% of the munitions used in Iraq were so-called smart weapons. But this uh, precision convinced a lot of people that smart, so-called smart technology can do anything. Notice what's circled here. These are weapons dealers saying, we're gonna turn our uh, smart weapons into a war against congestion. And I mean, they're really saying this as incredible as it sounds. Uh, they're going to use the same technology to fight congestion. This takes the form of the smart highways boondoggle of the 1990s in which billions of dollars were wasted developing highways that were supposed to make crashes and congestion both impossible. They got nowhere close to this, although they sure spent a lot of money pursuing it. They achieved little stunts like uh, hands-free driving on test roads. This road has thousands of magnets embedded in it so that the car can follow it along. These cars can follow closely behind each other. Notice the hands out of the windows showing that their hands are not on the steering wheel on this test road. What they have just invented here is the most inefficient train ever built, right? We have one person per train car um, and uh, also incredibly inefficient with, in terms of fuel. It's supposed to relieve traffic congestion, but as people pointed out at the time, uh, what happens when they get on the exit ramp to go into the city? Of course, they back up into the highway. So this was a completely futile waste. As you probably are guessing, this means you have to promise another generation of Futuramas. That's why we're on Futurama 4. These happen every 25 years. 
This is Autonorama. I call it that because it's autonomous vehicles, but like Futurama. Um, again, the technology is so amazing that it tends to make people believe the unbelievable, which is unfortunate because amazing technology can be amazing, but that does not mean it solves every problem you have. You've probably heard perhaps of the Pentagon funded DARPA grand challenges where vehicles, uh, driverless vehicles performed in deserts. By 2010, General Motors is promising a vision of the city of the future in 2030. This time it's Shanghai, 20 years into the future. So it was 2010, that means 2030. They had a film at Shanghai's Expo 2010. Here's where it was presented. And when you went entered, you saw that you were going to see a future free of emissions, free of petroleum, free of congestion, free of crashes. And you saw that on a big screen. Here are three, three shots from that movie. This is supposed to be a zero emissions carbon neutral future. We are 12 of the 20 years toward this future that General Motors and its Chinese partner depicted. Uh, we are, of course, nowhere close, remotely close to this. The middle, middle, excuse me, the middle vehicle works on photosynthesis. That's a giant leaf on its top. So believability apparently does not matter. One of the advantages supposedly is that people, instead of looking at the road, can look at social media. This means, of course, they're generating monetizable data. Um, General Motors is promising zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. Notice they're promising perfection. By promising perfection, they are still true to Charles Kettering's precept. They are keeping the consumer dissatisfied because you can never deliver perfection, but you can sell a lot of stuff as people uh, engage in this vain pursuit of the impossible. They're still promising a future without congestion, just like they were 80 years ago. They're still promising, uh, they're promising that you'll use social media while you're driving instead of looking at the road. Of course, this means generating monetizable data. Uh, they'll try to get you to be in the car more time, not less time, because that way you'll generate more monetizable data, uh, as you can see here. I wanna wrap up with a conclusion now about escaping from Futurama. Um, I think this begins with keeping in mind the difference between a tool and a solution, abandoning the war metaphor, abandoning the pursuit of transport per perfection, which actually yields transport consumerism, and instead pursuing transport sufficiency. So just like a gardener should not try to exterminate all insects, but rather develop a balanced garden. Well, we too can, can pursue a kind of balance if we choose our tools well. We need full spectrum innovation. That means uh, not just the high tech stuff, but we also need low tech and zero tech. We need the whole thing uh, and I would prefer to call low tech and zero tech high soch if you follow my meaning. We have good examples. The Netherlands does this extremely well, for example. Um, there are people who will say, well, look, the Netherlands had a rebellion. Here you see Amsterdam 1972, people rebelling. While in the US, we had a love affair with the automobile. So you could not have a rebellion like this. But I want to disagree with that and say we actually don't know what Americans prefer. When we see people in situations like this in the USA, we cannot say that when these young men get a car, it's because they prefer to drive. It's rather because they have no choices, right? Uh, in this kind of typical American situation, uh, people who choose to drive cannot be interpreted as making that choice due to some kind of essential preference. It's not a choice at all in an environment like this. And this, of course, goes, the, the caption for this picture from 1970 is children on their way to school in Philadelphia. Now, there were, this is the, the Dutch rebellion. The USA had these two, and I'll bet the Australia did. I just haven't found. But the rebellions, like you see on the left, happened 20 years earlier than the ones in the Netherlands. And they were very similar. And strangely, they have all been forgotten. They were very common. They happened in all cities in the USA, practically. Here's one in Los Angeles, people demanding 
Safe Streets, Safe Streets for Their Children in 1958. In Queens, New York in 1959. Here's Philadelphia again. These people are breaking the law to draw attention to streets that are hostile to pedestrians and hostile to children. These rebellions were ubiquitous and they have been forgotten. If we can recover them, we legitimize our cause, right? These people are demanding safe streets with slower traffic as well. So uh, I think we can do no better than ask ourselves, how can we apply the wisdom uh, that we need to the so-called smart and intelligent systems that we have? And I think uh, Rachel Carson's message for ecology, if we generalize it well, can help us distinguish tools from solutions and thereby help us find a path toward the common sense mobility future we need that is the healthful, affordable, sustainable, inclusive, um, and uh, efficient mobility future that we all are seeking. Uh, thanks very much. And I'll stop sharing here. Oh, wow, that was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. I mean, you know, I'm actually campaigning for safer streets. So it's it's kind of also a bit daunting to see how long that has been going on. So, um, yeah, very interesting. And also, yeah, maybe, maybe I might ask the first question to you. Why do you think why the, you know, I'm from Germany. And so obviously Germany is also a lot more focused on walkability and is it just nicer driver behavior similar to holland not as good but similar and I, I just struggle with this australian attitude of you know the strongest has the right away basically which is not very much with the values otherwise but in traffic it seems different and i i don't understand why that is so different in america and australia compared to these other like japan germany holland it's not really the question who watches out for who is just, just a, it's something I don't understand 100% and I don't know why, why, why would, was it successful in Holland and not in America? Do you think it has to do with the industry power? Is that what you're kind of thinking? Yeah, so when, uh, when I was talking about the 1920s, uh, there were proposals to do things to make streets safer for pedestrians and children. Uh, and more inviting places for people in general. And some of those proposals terrified the people who wanted to sell cars in cities. Um, I, the, most, the most striking example was that in 1923, 42,000 people in the city of Cincinnati signed petitions saying, we demand that every motor vehicle in the city of Cincinnati be equipped with a mechanical speed governor that would make it impossible to drive faster than 25 miles per hour. That's something I'm campaigning for. The, okay, well, yeah. And, and the industry panicked and organized. And I read the accounts of their meetings and they say, boys, of course they were all men, um, we have to redefine the street as a place for cars. And so that's why I quoted that editorial where the editorial writer says, the obvious solution lies only in a radical revision in our conception of what a city street is for, which is a really amazing statement. And it was substantially successful, but it was a very, um, it took a lot of effort and a lot of imagination to make it work. And I, I think the good news for us is their success can teach us about how to shift norms, how to shift laws and how to shift engineering standards because they did all that a hundred years ago in the US. Maybe I can, Sarah, do you wanna ask your question or do you want me to ask it for you? Could, uh, is that me, Sarah Lowe? Yeah, Sarah Lowe. Yeah, could you ask it please, Lena? Sorry, I'm, I'm home sick with COVID in bed. Oh, oh. So I won't, I'll spare you my video. Thank thank you. You. <laughs> okay, she said, great talk and work. Thank you, Peter. Apart from the confusion of tool and solution and third for perception, it sounds like okay. the vested interest of the yeah. automotive and defense industries are key. How do you suggest we tackle this? 
What are the elements of success where this has worked? Such an important question. Um, it, uh, it, it would be a long answer to give it a fair answer. I'll give it, uh, I'll try to find a way to answer it briefly. And here's one. We have been through this before with other powerful industries. And I think we can learn from that experience. So one is one example is uh, cigarette smoking, of course, used to be much, much more common. And as a result, many people lost decades off of their lifespan. And in the 50s already, there were there was definitive evidence that uh, cigarettes were shortening people's lifespans by decades and impairing their health too. Um, and uh, one response to this information by the tobacco companies, well, there, there were really two main responses. One was at first to cast doubt on the research, right, which we've seen happen, particularly with the climate information. We saw deliberate efforts to cast doubt on the research demonstrating a connection between greenhouse gas emissions and climate. But a sec and that part is, I think, fairly is well known. The second part is maybe less well known, and that is that the cigarette companies tried to convince people that you can keep smoking if you just buy this brand that has this amazing formulation and has this really amazing filter. And the magazine advertisements would have a blueprint of this filter to impress you that this was a high tech filter. And because it was a high tech filter, it would be safe to smoke. We know in retrospect that the people who believed that typically lost many years off of their life because of the fact that the filters don't make cigarettes safe. Well, the same is true when we're dealing with people trying to convince us that technology like autonomous vehicles will make car dependency work. The technology will not make car dependency work. And uh, just as ultimately after the, a delay, thanks to the cigarette company's response, ultimately smoking rates did fall steeply. Uh, there are reasons for that fall having to do with public health techniques. If we view the automobile's excesses as a public health problem and apply public health techniques that have been learned and practiced and proven, we can also diminish the incidence of driving in ways that will, to a significant degree at least, be accepted. Thank you. Um, and can I now ask Wyden to ask his question? Or would you rather want me to read it, Wyden? Hi. Good day. Yeah. Um, thanks, Peter, for uh, your very insightful uh, presentation. I'm just wondering, could you please comment on the Sydney um, motorway, the M4 motorway, which is the main Western motorway, uh, which the government's just implemented new smart technologies and gantries, supposedly using this smart technology to regulate speed and also to supposedly reduce traffic collisions and whatnot. The government's held it as a success since it rolled out at the end of 2020, but is, would you say this is probably another example of um, just te using technology to supposedly solve congestion, which really, really just encourages more people to use the road? So I probably know less about the specific motorways in question here than everyone on this call. I, I have learned some thanks to Andrew sharing a, an amazing documentary film about, about uh, the motorway projects around Sydney. Um, I can speak more generally about the technology that is supposed to make, uh, you know, control speeds better, improve enforcement, and um, also uh, charge people for the road capacity that they use. And on that, I mean, I think there is some good news. If we could actually charge drivers for the cost of the road capacity that they use, then we would not have this um, wasteful situation that predominates now where drivers typically do not pay anything close to the cost of the road capacity that they use and therefore are wasteful with it. Just like if you uh, charge uh, 10 cents for a pizza, people will eat too much of it or buy, get too much of it or waste it. 
The same is true for road capacity. And so theoretically, the technology can help with the road capacity, just like the London congestion charge helps make London a much more pleasant city to be in within that ring of the, of the congestion zone. Well, the application though, doesn't have to be that way. Uh, in the US, I could cite examples of toll roads where the real effort behind the tolling is just to supply money for ever more road projects. So the tolling technology can be a wonderful contributor to something less excessive and less wasteful, but it does not automatically turn into that. It can also turn into a revenue stream for ever more road expansion. And the next question is from Craig. Craig, do you want to ask a question about the rebellion? Sure, thanks, Lena. Um, hi, Peter. Uh, love your work. Um, I'm a historian myself, so this is a, a way in which I, um, I'm a social streets advocate as, as well in Queensland and Australia. So history is one of the ways I try to frame um, this issue. Um, and of course, Looking at the Netherlands as, as an example, uh, my understanding is, is that in the 1960s and 70s, they were essentially along the same trajectory as American cities. Um, they were demolishing uh, residential buildings, they were building freeways and highways and so on. Um, and, and their transformation since that time is, is obviously something that's quite fascinating. Um, and and I, I noted how you talked about rebellion um, and, and obviously referred to that rebellion there. Um, I wonder if you know, is, is there, given, given the effort and the power of the message and, and the marketing for motordom that we've seen over the 20th century and we continue to see today with all those points that you raised, I mean, is there a viable way to deal with this issue in any kind of time frame that meets things like climate change goals, uh, safe streets, without rebellion? I mean, is, is that, and, and, and do we, are we in a similar inflection point at the moment, for example, with the oil crisis in the 70s, where, you know, the price of petrol is going up um, and, and a pandemic and things like that. Are there times that we need to move and mobilise more substantially um, to, to take advantage of these um, broader conditions? Uh, I'm terrified at, at our current situation. Um, I, I, it's quite obvious that change has to happen very quickly, um, much more quickly than is imaginable. Um, but I think that a rebellion is essential. Um, I think one of the, uh, uh, I think there's a tendency to, to expect uh, policymakers to uh, rise to the occasion, uh, but uh, policymakers of course respond to pressure. They don't create pressure. And the pressure they typically respond to is the pressure of the people trying to protect their markets. And um, the only chance we citizens have to compete with that pressure is to make ourselves unignorable, which is what uh, rebellions can do. I think the Dutch have an ex excellent example here because their rebellion in the 1960s and 1970s wasn't merely a rebellion, it was also very ingenious. Um, they uh, were very inventive in their rebellion. Um, uh, there's some very interesting work on this. Uh, uh, for example, some of the projects of Lud Schimmelpenik, who was uh, extremely, almost uh, an artist of rebellion and had a, a genius for rebelling in ways that opened people's minds revealed new possibilities, attracted the attention of the media and so on. Um, but uh, no, I don't see any easy way or obvious way to get, get where we need to go. All I can do is try to join in the growing number of voices demanding change. Thank you. Okay, and the next question is from Rachel. Do you, Rachel? Ah, thanks very much. Uh, look, a really good presentation. Thanks heaps, Peter, and I look forward to ingesting more of your work. Um, I just wanted to actually make a comment about the anti-West Connex campaign in Sydney that is, um, you know, compared to the struggle in Melbourne against East-West Link 
and the struggle against the um, tollway in Fremantle, we weren't as successful. Andrew Tudor was um, critically involved, so he can comment a bit more. I guess the thing that we look to in Sydney is the green bands. And we know that the militant unions, um, when they step up, they can be extraordinary like the Builders Labourers Federation was in the 70s. So I guess um, my question is politically, where do you see the unions? Are they gonna back us? And also the federal elections in this country are coming up. Um, where, where do you see the, the, the left, the progressives um, coming out around urban issues? Over. So uh, maybe that's a question for Andrew. Um, <laughs> perhaps, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I really strongly agree, um, Rachel. The, the Green Bands movement and, and Jack Mundy uh, and, the, and the unions played an enormous part in helping to um, uh, stop motorway expansion in the 70s. Um, and, you know, it happened at a time with uh, the oil shocks where, um, uh, you know, um, it, there was a sort of a, a gradual, you know, a begrudging acknowledgement of, of the problems of um, car dependency. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think, um, I, thank you, Peter, because you also explained um, a lot about um, the, those innovative campaigns that have happened, particularly um, in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, you know, and, and Lena's work, you know, if, if we can, if we can harness the, the, you know, children, parents and those attitudes as well, um, that, that could, um, that could have a strong uh, influence um, as well. Okay, and um, next question is by Lee. Lee Roberts. Ah, thanks. Hi, Peter. Um, great, great to see you in person. Um, uh, like everybody else, love your work. Um, I, I was so I have an architecture background, um, and uh, the the Futurama idea and the sort of these utopian visions are so powerful, both in transportation, but also in in architecture and the built environment. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, how do we, is, is there a way to, to um, pitch these ideas that, that uh, appeals to maybe our natural human inclination to seek perfect solutions or seek utopia? You know, how do we, how do we compete against that um, if, we're, if we're not promising something that's equally sexy? Right. Well, I think there's a lot to learn from the incredible success of the people who sold us car dependency um, because they had all the obstacles that we have. They had, I mean, the laws were against them. The engineering standards of that time were against them and the social norms were against them. And if they could turn those around, I think it's worth studying how they did it and seeing what we can do to counteract it. And I think one of the things that's important is to depict attractive futures that are worth effort pursuing. Futurama was depicting an attractive future with the intention of enlisting popular support behind the vision, uh, in that case of General Motors' uh, idea of the future. So we need attractive visions of the future too. Uh, we tend, I think of course, as we should, to stress the real threats that we face, the dangers, and we have to. But we, I think it's urgent also that we depict attractive futures, and we do see that. Um, I, I think one of the, uh, to me, one of the most effective examples of this is in um, the uh, website Street Films. Uh, they're made by Clarence Eckerson. Maybe I'm sure some of you know have seen them, and by just showing us. 10 to 20 minute videos of attractive, pedestrian friendly, bicycle friendly, transit friendly, sustainable urban settings. He's helping to make the change we need to frame it positively, to enlist our, our, our enthusiasm as well as our fears. Um, I, I've stressed already that we have a lot to learn from successful public health campaigns and one thing the public health people have all concluded from hard earned experience is that if you just frighten people, they will want to avoid you, right? So they learned 
that the what they call fear appeals, um, while they have a place, are never sufficient because they have a tendency to make people want to to become fatalistic or to to go into denial or uh, in other in other ways to respond that don't help us solve the problem. And um, future almost was a way of showing us uh, attract uh, of attractive. Uh, techniques. Um, and so I think we have a lot to learn from those. Okay, now I will give the last question to um, David Levinson. And I think then we have to um, let you go to bed, I guess. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, technologies often take a very long time to emerge from when they're first conceived. So, I mean, you've been looking at Futuramas for uh, basically they're 90 years old, now, um, the automobile took 100 years from the first prototypes till mass production and widespread deployment. Um, when are we actually, in your view, going to see hands-off driving become widespread, say, the level of automobiles post-World War I? Wow. Um, so. I'm not persuaded that we will ever see high-tech vehicles with hands-off driving per pervade society to anything like the great conventional automobiles did even by the 1920s, let alone the extent to which they have pervaded society now. Um, I think we have been getting a lot of marketing, uh, a lot of attempts to attract investment, um, and the, uh, I, and I, to, to my astonishment, I haven't even really heard a clear case for why anybody would want to pursue that. Even people who accept car dependency, which I emphatically don't, I still don't even see what the attraction is because of the fact that to make an automated vehicle, hands-off steering vehicle safe, um, with even with the state-of-the-art technology we have now, would require it to be so cautious that no one would pay to ride in it. Um, I'm just uh, uh, the the other way to make them work is to turn all urban settings into the equivalent of suburban Phoenix, where we do have Waymo now. And suburban Phoenix, to any common sense person that I, as I can see it, is a hellscape of unwalkable, uh, car-dominated, wasteful, um, energy-intensive, uh, unhealthful, um, exclusive places. So it's interesting because to make conventional cars work in cities, we, particularly in the US, destroyed our cities because then cars can work in them. And what the people selling autonomous vehicles are saying sometimes explicitly, is we have to rebuild our cities again so that the cars will, autonomous cars will work in them. Now, I think it's quite obvious that your tool fails if you have to design your project around the tool. That's a failed tool. The tool should serve your project and not require you to rebuild your project around the limitations of the tool. So it's, this is a long way of saying um, I'm not, I don't think it will ever happen. Uh. All right. Yes, so I think um, we would uh, wrap it up then. And thank you so much. It was really, really, really interesting. And thank you all for your questions. Sorry that we couldn't um, answer all of them, but most of them I think we did. So, and yeah, you're very welcome. I think all of our three co-hosting organizations are looking for more members and more people who get more involved. So. Um, be great to um, build the movement. It was such a pleasure being with you all. I'm, I'm really admire. I know that perhaps all of you, or at least most of you, are engaged in the work of getting us to the kind of future we need. And I'm just moved to be permitted to be in your company. Uh, thank you for everything that all of you do. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you.